G'day, I'm Rowan Mackey and welcome to Individuate, the podcast where we use the vehicle of starting our own podcast to try and get the best out of ourselves in the service of others. For today's episode, I want to build upon some of what we've spoken about in the last few weeks. So we'll be looking at how to speed up our learning. How can we become an expert without having to toil away for 20 years like Auguste Rodin, the sculptor we spoke about in episode 9? How can we speed up the consumption and imitation stages, being the first two laws of Alan Gannett's creative curve, so we can get through to the creative community and iteration stages of the creative process? Today, I want to look at the work of three of my favourite authors, because I think they're all trying to make a similar point in a different way. And although they each emphasise different aspects of the process, I think there's a way to unify each of their theories. So today, I'll be going through each of these theories briefly, and then we'll bring it all back together with a look at one of my favourite sports, which I'm excited about. We're 12 episodes into the podcast, and we haven't even spoken about my greatest love, which is sport. So we'll do that today. Apologies if I go full nuffy. But before we do that, I want to tell you about the origins of a very famous story. One day, Pablo Picasso sat in a restaurant having dinner. A woman approached the famous painter and eagerly asked him to scribble something on a napkin, stating she would be happy to pay whatever he felt it was worth. To the excitement of the woman, Picasso scribbled away on the napkin, completing her request by drawing a picture on the back of the restaurant napkin and presenting it to her. That will be $10,000, proclaimed Picasso. The woman was taken aback. But you did that in 30 seconds, she said. No, Picasso said. It has taken me 40 years to do that. In 1877, famous artist James McNeil Whistler held an exhibition at the Grosvenor Gallery in London, including his painting Nocturne in Black and Gold. The art critic John Ruskin's evaluation of the painting was incredibly harsh, claiming that the prices for the pieces of art were absurdly high and the gallery's owners should not have admitted the painting because its crude technique devalued all of the other works beside it. To quote Ruskin, I have seen and heard much of cockney impudence before now, but never expected to hear a coxcomb ask 200 guineas for fleeing a pot of paint in the public's face. Coxcomb being an old term for a vale and conceited man, what we'd maybe call today a fool or a charlatan. Whistler believed this harsh appraisal to go as far as defamation, and so he took Ruskin to court. In 1878, the Times of London reported Whistler's testimony at the trial. In court, he admitted that Nocturne in black and gold was painted quickly, but he believed it to still be very valuable. The Times of London read, Of course, he expected that his pictures would be criticised. The Nocturne in black and gold he knocked off in a couple of days. He painted the picture one day and finished it off the next. He did not give his pictures time to mallow, but he exposed him in the open air to dry as he went on with his work. He did not ask 200 guineas for two days' work, He asked it for the knowledge he had gained in the work of a lifetime. So, I'm not quite sure whether Pablo Picasso in fact said what he was reported to in that restaurant with the napkin. But if he did, then surely he was at least influenced by Whistler, whose remarks were made many years earlier. According to the quote investigator, the first time the Picasso story appeared was in the 1984 book What They Don't Teach You at Harvard Business School by Mark H. McCormack. But Picasso died in 1973, so I'm not 100% sure whether this story in fact happened just like this, or whether McCormack chose to update the original story with a more recognisable protagonist. Regardless of who said it, what I want to talk about today is what they meant by it. Because the two master artists both recognised that they had undergone many stages of learning, and clearly had some level of understanding of what those many stages were. And I want to unpack that today. Why was it that James McNeil Whistler and Pablo Picasso felt the need to charge so much for what was seemingly a trivial output of their time and energy? What these artists realised is that it takes a lot of time, effort and personal sacrifice to develop the skills that they had and they knew that undervaluing their abilities and charging less would equate them in value with someone else charging smaller amounts for paintings 
even if they hadn't put in as much work or developed the same skill as the great artists. So what exactly was it that the artists realised? What was this extensive learning process that allowed them to stand out from their peers and go on to become the greatest artists who we still speak about today? How can we separate the best from the rest and ensure that everything we do is of the highest possible quality and take the shortest amount of time to learn the skills to produce it? The first person I want to turn to for some answers is the owner of probably my favourite brain in the world, Malcolm Gladwell. His podcast, Revisionist History, is probably my favourite podcast, but there's a chapter in his 2008 book, Outliers, that I want to speak about today. In the second chapter of Outliers, Gladwell speaks about the 10,000 hour rule. I'm sure you've heard of this rule before, but it's based on the work of psychologist K. Anders Ericsson. Ericsson, along with two colleagues, completed research at the Berlin Elite Academy of Music in the early 1990s. Through his work with the virtuosos, Ericsson was able to ascertain that the students who performed the best were also the ones who were able to practice the most throughout their life. The elite students averaged many more hours per week since childhood than those students who had followed other pursuits or did not have the resources to afford so much time towards practicing. To quote neurologist Daniel Levitin, as Gladwell does in his book, The emerging picture from such studies is that 10,000 hours of practice is required to achieve the level of mastery associated with being a world-class expert in anything. In Outliers, Gladwell uses two examples to demonstrate his theory that if someone is afforded the opportunity for 10,000 hours worth of practice, they are more likely to become a world expert. Gladwell's first example he speaks of is of the Beatles, one of the greatest, if not the greatest, band of all time. The Beatles had five trips to Germany between 1960 and 1962. During these trips, they were playing eight-hour shows, so they really had to expand their understanding of music and ability as a band in order to keep people entertained for that long. John Lennon later spoke of the time in Germany when he said, We got better and got more confidence. We couldn't help it with all the experience playing all night long. It was handy them being foreign. We had to try even harder, put our heart and soul into it to get ourselves over. During those trips to Germany, the Beatles played 270 nights in just over a year and a half. In fact, by the time they received their first real success in 1964, it's estimated that they'd played live together over 1,200 times. Gladwell also uses the example of Bill Gates. As a child, the Microsoft founder was clearly intelligent and found himself bored with the assigned classwork he was given at school. Gates came from an affluent family in Seattle, and so... At the start of the seventh grade, his parents took him out of the public school system and sent him to a wealthy private school. At this school, Gates was afforded the opportunity of a lifetime. Through a fundraiser of the school's parents, the school was able to purchase what was essentially an early computer programming machine. This was 1968, so hardly any universities had access to these types of machines at the time. The fact that Gates' school had one of these was an incredible resource for the eager teenager to have access to. Without boring you too much with all the technicalities, these machines allowed multiple people to program into a central terminal at the same time. Prior to this, computer programmers would have to book time into a shared computer and the process was so laborious that they could never really develop their skills. They weren't able to get enough time with the computer themselves to really hone their abilities beyond a basic understanding. That was until the technology that Bill Gates' school purchased. This means that Gates had access to some of the most cutting-edge computer programming technology in the world, and he was 13 years old. Based on his later success, I probably don't need to tell you too much about what happened next. Gates practically lived in the computer room, spending as much of his time as possible learning the programming machine along with a couple of other students at the school. This created opportunities for Gates. Companies needed computer programmers who were familiar with the technology so that they could test out their software programs and Gates and his friends were all too happy to oblige on weekends in exchange for more programming time. Much of Gates' teenage years was spent either computer programming or completing tasks that would allow him to access a computer for more time to spend programming. By the time Gates dropped out of Harvard after his sophomore year to start his own little software company, 
He'd been computer programming literally as much as he could for seven years. If there were 50 teenagers in the world with as much experience as I had, I'd be stunned, Gates later said. Now, when I first read this chapter in Outliers, I thought the point that Gladwell was trying to make was that with the opportunity to practice for 10,000 hours, anyone can be a world expert. It seems to me that Gladwell is suggesting that the opportunities for practice that Bill Gates and the Beatles had allowed them to amass 10,000 hours, and this alone is what drove their greatness. Gladwell even says this himself in Outliers when he says of Gates and the Beatles. But what distinguishes their histories is not their extraordinary talent, but their extraordinary opportunities. The Beatles, for the most random of reasons, got invited to go to Hamburg. Without Hamburg, the Beatles might well have taken a different path. I was very lucky, Bill Gates said at the beginning of our interview, That doesn't mean he isn't brilliant or an extraordinary entrepreneur. It just means that he understands what incredibly good fortune it was to be at his school in 1968. Now, I just want to stress again how much of a fanboy of Malcolm Gladwell I am. I literally listened to his podcast yesterday. But reading this, I think he's only got half the point. And I think it's important to suggest that I think Malcolm Gladwell recognises this too. He copped a fair bit of criticism for this chapter in Outliers, and he's since defended it, saying that it's largely been misunderstood. And there's a few flippant comments that Gladwell makes that seems to suggest that he's aware that there's a bit more to it too. But a bit more on that later on. One person who also picked up on the fact that Gladwell missed something was Alan Gannett in his book The Creative Curve. Gannett builds upon Gladwell's notion of 10,000 hours, but he adds something essential to the process. Purposeful practice. Gannett points to a study of elite sprinters in which the researchers found that there was not just a physical difference between the sprinters who were most successful and their least successful rivals, but also a mental one. They found that the elite sprinters who experienced the most success spent more time monitoring their internal states more closely and focused more on planning their race performance during competition than the less accomplished runners. Another study Gannett points to pointed to elite chess players. The study concluded that the expert players had more advanced mental patterns of critical chess positions, allowing them to play better than the average players. These patterns are what psychologists call mental models. They're your brain's representation of a concept or a situation. In research for his book, Gannett spoke with Kay Anders Ericsson, the original author of the 10,000 Hours study. And Erickson points out that in writing Outliers, he thought that Gladwell had actually misread his paper. And he suggested a couple of misrepresentations that Gladwell had made. Firstly, Erickson recognised that it wasn't just the number of hours someone spent on the activity, but it was how they spent those hours. Most people who are highly experienced aren't necessarily all that much better than a novice, because most people, once proficient, will stop trying to consciously improve. Gannett uses the example of driving. Many people would have spent 10,000 hours driving, but I still think Lewis Hamilton could take them in a hot lap, regardless of how long they've spent behind the wheel. Most of us, once we've learned the basics of driving and received our license, will be satisfied with the extent of our abilities once we're comfortable behind the wheel, and so we won't even look to attain expert status when it comes to driving a car. The reason for this is because once we've learned to skill, it becomes automatic and it no longer requires the same conscious thought that it once did. As Ericsson says, being automatic is the enemy of growing your expertise. So, why is this? What is the actual difference between being purposeful with your practice and automatically carrying out a task, even if we do it many, many times? The difference is that non-purposeful practice, which is practicing things you already know how to do, reinforces the mental processes that are already established. Purposeful practice allows the students to gain new mental methods and improve their abilities. That is to say, if you're carrying out a task without the internal monitoring like the elite sprinters, you won't improve. You'll just reinforce your current method of doing something. To perform an activity is one thing, but we have to have an awareness of how we are performing that activity in order to recognise where we can improve. The second flaw with Gladwell's 10,000 hours rule is that Ericsson's study didn't actually find that 10,000 hours is what it takes to be an expert. 
10,000 hours was the average of those who they studied. Like everything, there's going to be a different amount of time for everyone to master a task, even with purposeful or deliberate practice. Then, the task itself makes a huge difference. It probably doesn't take 10,000 hours to become world-class at making an omelette, but Hester Blumenthal's exploding chocolate gateau is probably a different story. So, the complexity of skill needed to be world-class in a task is relevant to the amount of time needed to master it. But then there's also the element of competition. Skills that have fewer people pursuing them require less time to master. For example, if you want to be recognised as a world-class tennis player, you're competing with the many millions of boys and girls around the world who also play tennis. The standard at which we consider someone a tennis expert is quite high. But if you're an expert in underwater hockey, for example, there's likely to be less competition. You won't need to be as proficient in underwater hockey to be considered an expert. No disrespect to all my underwater hockey experts listening out there. So, to sum up this section of the podcast, as Ericsson and Gannett point out, there's more to it than just 10,000 hours. And there's even more to it than 10,000 hours of purposeful practice. It could take longer, or it could even be a shorter amount of time. To quote Gannett, Research shows that exceptional talent is not always the result of winning the genetic lottery, but instead the outcome of immense amounts of structured, purposeful practice. But as much as I absolutely respect him, I think Gannett could take it further too. I do think that structured, purposeful practice will supercharge your learning, but there's more to it than that. This is something that's recognised by author and host of the three-month vacation podcast, Sean D'Souza. I've been lucky enough to see Sean speak a few times now at the We Are Podcast Conference. And he's honestly one of the most astute people I've ever come across. His website, psychotactics.com, has been an absolutely invaluable source of information for me. I'd absolutely recommend it to anyone in business, or indeed his podcast, The Three Month Vacation. But as Sean points out, there's an element beyond purposeful practice that's important too. When we're learning something new, regardless of who we are or what it is that we're doing, We're going to interpret information in our own way. We're all individuals and we want to be creative and we may be influenced by our existing mental models. But in learning a new process or a new mental model, it's not beneficial to be creative. Being creative leads us to do things in our own inexperienced way. Yes, we must practice in a way that's purposeful, but also in a way that leads to a reduction in errors as time goes by. Sean defines talent as simply a reduction in errors. According to Sean, the less errors we're able to produce, the more talented we are. So, how do we do this? How can we ensure that our purposeful practice is actually improving our ability and our new mental models are effective? One significant factor, and the third element of our process for today's podcast, is having a teacher guide us and correct us when we make mistakes. As Sean says, We need to have a teacher, not a preacher. The difference between a teacher and a preacher is that a preacher will spell out a whole range of information and the preacher feels that it's incumbent upon the student to take in that information and integrate it with their existing understanding in such a way that matches up with the preacher's own. A teacher, however, will realise that their role is not to transfer information, it's to transfer skills. It's the responsibility of the teacher to ensure that those skills are transferred across to the student, not the other way around. That is to say, that it's not just about having 10,000 hours of even purposeful practice or any other number. It's about having lots and lots of purposeful practice with a teacher to correct your mistakes. It's about having 10,000 hours of correct purposeful practice. To demonstrate this, Sean categorises our ability in certain tasks into three boxes. In the first box are all the tasks we're hopeless at. The second box is all the tasks that we're kind of good at. We're not great at it yet, and we're definitely learning, but we're still making some mistakes. The third box is for all the tasks that we've achieved fluency, all the tasks that don't drain our brain's resources, and we could carry out almost on autopilot. I'll just pause here to note the similarity with Gay Hendricks zones that we spoke about in episode 8. These boxes remind me a lot of the zone of incompetence, zone of competence, and zone of excellence 
from Hendrick's book, The Big Leap. The role of the teacher, Sean says, is to get people from box one to box three. Otherwise, people spend too much time languishing in box two. They're not really hopeless at the activity, but they're not great at it yet. Remember what Leonardo da Vinci said in last week's episode, poor is the pupil who doesn't surpass the master. Well, I actually think you could argue it's incumbent upon the master to ensure their pupils surpass them. In order to help the student get from box one to box three, the teacher helps deconstruct the task into tiny increments in order for them to construct or piece together a mental model that incorporates all the tiny little increments that the teacher included. It's not just enough to practice a narrow task until you're really good at it. In order for the student to create proper mental models, they must be able to recognise all of the smaller elements within a task and be able to contextualise their importance. For example, when teaching someone to ride a bike, the teacher will likely start the student on a little bike that doesn't even have pedals. Then, maybe a tricycle. Then, maybe a bicycle with training wheels. This is so the student can learn the incremental skills of steering and then pedaling. And it's only when the student has become proficient in those that the extra element of balance is introduced. So, you take off the training wheels and away they go. Now finally having put together the entire skill of riding a bike. So it's not as if riding a bike is one monolithic skill. It's the combination of many tiny little skills that we incrementally build up to form the greater skill. That is, in this case, riding a bike. I'm going to have a fair bit more on this and the idea of being a teacher versus being a preacher in next week's episode because I think it's really important to how we learn, who we choose to learn from, and how we teach others. And this is one of the most central themes to being a good podcast host that I think people miss. People think it's about preaching information and trying to get as much information across as possible. But it's actually about being a teacher, not a preacher. It's about transferring skills, not just expressing information. It's about guiding your audience to their own development, rather than just having them bear witness to yours. But let's save a bit more of that for next week's episode, particularly the construction and deconstruction elements, because I'm keen to get into a bit more of it then. But for today, if we look back now at the model that we've created, We started with Malcolm Gladwell's 10,000 hours, but then we added to that Alan Gannett and Kay Anders Ericsson's idea of purposeful practice. On top of that, we've recognised that we need a teacher, not a preacher, to ensure that we receive around 10,000 hours of purposeful practice, but it's also correct. But remember what Ericsson said earlier about how being automatic is the enemy of growing your expertise. So it seems to me that we have to do all this in a way that ensures that we don't just slip into an automatic mental process. Otherwise, we won't be improving at all. We'll simply become proficient at our teacher's way of doing something. To me, this all points to something. And to explain it, I'm going to tell you about my golf game. As much as I absolutely love to play it, relative to where I want to be, I'm not good at golf. I watch a lot of golf, I play it when I can, and Tiger and Woods are probably the two most searched words on my YouTube. But as much as I hate to say it, I'm pretty much a classic weekend hacker. Well, after one particularly frustrating day a couple of years ago, where I was nearly ready to give the great game away, my dad and I decided to buy each other golf lessons for Christmas. Over the next few months, Dad and I would have our swings tuned up by Golf Pro. Well, one thing has really stood out to me that the Golf Pro said, and I think it's relevant to just about anything that we want to get better at. In the first lesson, I had a bucket of balls to hit while the pro was checking out my swing. I put down a golf ball, whack, watch it go down the range. Get out another ball, whack, watch it go down the range. Get out another ball, and so on. After I nearly ran out of balls, the pro pulled me up and said, Do you know that I coach professional golfers and in the time that you just hit nearly a whole bucket of balls, the pros might have hit eh, 10. At the time, I couldn't quite work it out. Surely you don't want to overthink things too much and 10 balls in about 20 minutes seemed like a lot of thinking time. But a couple of lessons later, after we'd worked out a few of the more major kinks in the swing, we got the chance to hit in front of a shot tracer. 
a little machine connected to an iPad which would give a quantitative analysis on each shot. Now, golf is a fickle game. I forgot to write down exactly which club it was, but I'm pretty sure it's a four iron. One of the longer clubs, but certainly not the longest. And if the face of your golf club is six degrees off when it comes into contact with the golf ball, so that's one minute of an analog watch hand, then you're missing the green. Golf is a game of single millimetres and single degrees. So getting analysis on your shots can be incredibly helpful. What happened after using this little shot tracer machine for a little while is that you'd start to calibrate the look and feel of your shot with the numbers that were being spat out by the machine. As you'd hit the ball down the range, you'd get a read of exactly how straight your swing was, whether your club face was straight when it connected with the ball, the angle of the club face with the ground to get a sense of the loft, all these sorts of measurements. And as you take more and more shots, you begin to calibrate your internal processes with the machine. A ball would go slightly left, and before looking up, you'd have an idea roughly of what the numbers were going to be, just through the feel. A ball would go relatively straight, but you'd recognise that it wasn't the most purely technical swing, and lo and behold, the machine would confirm it. And this is what the best golf pros are doing with each shot. This is why they're taking so long to meticulously analyse and reflect on their performance every single time. They're monitoring their internal states much more than what I was and matching this up with the end result. Stuff like, was my wrist at the correct angle during that shot? Did my head move out of position too quickly? Where on the club face did the ball hit exactly? These layers of analysis are going through elite golfers' heads all the time. And I think the reason for that is because the golfers' coaches, along with the shot tracing technology they use, allow them to add in what I consider to be the fourth element of the learning process. Something that Malcolm Gladwell, Alan Gannett and Sean D'Souza have all underemphasized, in my opinion. That fourth element is what I'm calling self-correction and meaningful experimentation. That is to say that we become our own teacher and are able to refine our own process of deconstruction and construction. I believe that absolutely everything that we've spoken about so far has been pointing to this. It's one thing to practice enough to gain the requisite experience to be an expert. It's another thing to practice purposefully, to be able to ensure that you make use of that time that you practice. It's another thing again to find a teacher, not a preacher, to ensure that you don't make mistakes and your purposeful practice is efficiently delivering you towards expert status. But I think it all leads to the ability to self-correct and experiment in a way that contains both novelty and familiarity. But it's also unique to us, not just experimenting randomly. This is similar to Alan Gannett's idea of iterations that we spoke about, the fourth step in the creative process. But I think it's also part of the learning process too. Because we have to learn how to create something in our own unique style before we can even think about updating it or creating another iteration, as Gannett would say. Think about Leonardo da Vinci, who went through this process with his master Verrocchio. Verrocchio had enough world-class students, who we still know today, to suggest that he was definitely a teacher, not a preacher. But it was only when Leonardo learned to experiment, having mastered the traditional way of doing things, that he became the genius that we know him to be today. Leonardo had been able to systemize the creation of his mental models more than his teacher was ever able to. And I think this is what he meant by poor is the pupil that doesn't surpass the master. It's also important to point out here too that this is backed up by the story of Verrocchio putting down his paintbrush never to paint again. By that time, Leonardo hadn't yet finished his apprenticeship, but he'd been able to create his own system for self-correction that was even ahead of Verrocchio's. Clearly, he'd been able to remove errors that Verrocchio didn't even know himself how to remove. And so I think that there's an extra element of the learning process that these three great authors underemphasized. I also must say that I think it's something that they recognize to a degree. Malcolm Gladwell refers to one of Bill Gates' mentors, John Norton, who Gates says taught him about as much about programming as anyone he ever met. He was Gates' teacher. He helped Gates get to the stage where he could not only self-correct in that he'd mastered the skill, but that he'd also been able to transcend the need for any education anyone could give him. He left Harvard at age 20. Clearly he felt at that stage that there were no teachers there who could develop his knowledge more than he felt he could himself. Gladwell also subtly picks up on this when he quotes John Lennon. Lennon said of his time in Germany 
It was handy them being foreign. We had to try even harder. The Beatles would have been intrinsically motivated to improve as a band. Because if they didn't, then it would have been a horrible experience playing for eight hours a day, day after day. They had no choice but to practice purposefully and to learn to self-correct. Gannett too, I think, recognised the importance of this extra step when he said, Ericsson's research shows that you have to engage extensively in purposeful practice. This is a particular type of practice where you would work on one small skill repeatedly with a clear goal and feedback mechanism. Well, that's exactly it. Except this feedback mechanism needs to be about more than just monitoring our internal states and constantly updating our mental models. We need to be able to deconstruct the task and construct a mental model that reduces errors. We've got to develop our own golf shot tracing machine that allows us to calibrate those internal states to a successful outcome. That is to say that we need a teacher to ensure that we're learning techniques and skills correctly in the fastest way possible. But then the teacher needs to provide us with an ability to be our own teacher. That is, we have to be able to think critically beyond just our teacher's interpretation. We can't be restricted by our teacher's understanding or dogma or limitations. Like Leonardo, we have to become our own master so that we can do things correctly and respect familiarity, but introduce novelty in our own unique way. In order for the student to do this, I think they need to be able to do two things. The first is, they have to be able to recognise the elements of their teacher's exemplar. Remember in episode 9, we spoke about the idea of an exemplar being that which takes a central premise of something and abstracts it. For example, there's technically no such thing as a singer, but there are different individual versions of singers who each have their own take on what it is to be a singer. Ed Sheeran is the exemplar. The singer is the premise. Sam Kerr is the exemplar. Footballer is the premise. Gordon Ramsay is the exemplar. Chef is the premise. I think you get the point. In order to get to the self-correction stage of the learning process, you have to be able to recognise your teacher's individuality. So you recognise whether you're replicating their idiosyncrasies or whether something that they've taught you is indeed central to the process. For example... I think that this is part of the reason that professional tennis players so often switch coaches. For whatever reason, they feel that their coach's individual characteristics are overbearing or influencing them in a negative way. And so they look for someone who doesn't have those characteristics or will, at the very least, soften them and allow the player to develop more in their own way. There's only one game of tennis, but each individual expert has their own ideas on how it should be played. I think partly because they've learnt how to self-correct. The second thing that I think people must do to pass the student stage of the learning process is that they have to be able to analyse the quality of their education. They have to attain the broader proficiency in something to recognise whether the way that they were taught was good or bad. In many ways, they have to become an autodidact or someone who can teach themselves without reliance on a teacher. In order to do this, they must learn other ways of doing things, of going beyond just their teacher's methods and ultimately, to create their own way of doing things. To be able to properly evaluate our own education, we must be able to contextualise it amongst other ways of learning a task. In order to do this, we have to understand the broader field of knowledge, beyond just the way that it was presented to us by our teacher, even if it was technically correct. In my opinion, there's an extra level of critical thinking that comes into it, and the best teachers will recognise this, and help their students attain this ability, rather than professing to know the right way or the best way of how to do things. So, let's sum this all up. I think Malcolm Gladwell inadvertently stumbled upon the process. But it's not just about 10,000 hours practice, or even opportunities to have 10,000 hours practice. As Gannett points out, it's more about having opportunities to have purposeful practice. But there's no point doing that if we haven't been shown a way that's correct. And Sean D'Souza recognises that we need a teacher, not a preacher, to give us a system to learn correctly. And once we've learned how to implement that correct system from a respected teacher, then we can start to meta-analyse our education, to learn new ways of doing things and to create our own way. What are the parts of the process we'd keep? What parts will we look to do in a different, maybe more efficient way? And 
If we were to teach someone ourselves, what would we change about the learning process and why? Once we go through these steps and start to provide a meta-analysis, then we can seek out other teachers who may have more advanced skills to teach us. We can update the way that we do things to account for better methodologies that we come across and we can experiment in a way that's consistent with Alan Gannett's iterations model whilst also being consistent and authentic to our own individual way of doing things. This, I think at least partly, is what James McNeil Whistler and Pablo Picasso were so affronted by. Not only had they gone through the entire learning process from novice to master, they'd taught themselves how to self-correct. And Picasso, you could argue, is one of the most meaningful experimenters of all time. Those pictures that they drew on the napkin and the nocturne in black and gold weren't just pictures. They were the result of probably more than 10,000 hours of purposeful practice. They had such a mastery of painting that they would have deconstructed and constructed the entire process of painting masterpieces for themselves. As part of next week's episode, I'll talk you through some ways of improving purposeful practice, as well as construction and deconstruction. Today, I wanted to lay down some of the fundamental theory and also introduce my fourth step about self-correction and meaningful experimentation. We'll also have a bit more of a practical focus next week. And I'll pass on an online tool which saves me untold amounts of time. But before we finish up today, I want to tie up a few loose ends. Because it may not be immediately obvious how all this relates to individuation or even podcasting. First of all, I want to talk about podcasting. Not only does this process relate to becoming a better host and expanding our perspective. This is of course how our audience learns too. We have to recognize that they're on their own 10,000 hour journey and we have to be the teacher, not the preacher in a way that's going to transfer the deeper outcome across to them, not just provide information. Let's be frank for a minute. These days, you can access almost any information online, most of it for free. So your podcast or indeed your book, whatever it is, it has to be about the transferal of a skill or an outcome. It can't just be about the preaching of information. So that's what we're going to focus more on next week. How to be the teacher and not the preacher. Because there's a fair bit more to unpack and Sean D'Souza has a whole lot more that I'm keen to share. Finally, I do just want to readdress the whole link between individuation and podcasting, as well as what we've been speaking about today. To be honest, part of the reason is that I feel great respect for Carl Jung and I realise that I'm using his terminology. And there's a great responsibility that comes with that. I know some people won't want me using Jung's terminology to talk about podcasts, which didn't exist until more than 40 years after he died, but there's a couple of aspects I want to address. Firstly, the idea of starting a podcast in conjunction with exploring some of these themes of individuation also relates to a number that I often come back to. 51% of podcasts on Apple have less than six episodes. And I think part of this is because the practicality aspect of it People may not have a system in place to ensure that they'll produce it efficiently or get the return on investment soon enough to continue. But it's also incredible to note that more than 26% of podcasts on Apple have only one episode. Again, I think part of that is that people don't have a set system for how to do things. But as I said, that information is freely available on the internet. I honestly believe that it's because people realise that there's an element of coming to terms with yourself when you put out a podcast. It's about having a system to be able to continue, but it's also about coming to terms with the fact that you can be judged. And so you want to do something that's consistent with your deeper values and who you are beyond that surface persona that you present to the world. Like I said in episode four, I personally believe we're going to be judged even if we don't do things like a podcast, but there is still that aspect. And you've got to be authentic in presenting a podcast, otherwise there's no way it lasts. And how do you discover how to be authentic the process of individuation. So that's why I think there's a link there. The process of individuation helps us to become a better podcast host. It helps us to better understand our audience, but also podcasts are a real world example of why individuation is important. Most people I speak to say podcasting isn't for them. And that honestly pains me because I know that they've got so much to add and for whatever reason, there's something holding them back from putting their most authentic self out there and showing the world what they really care about. In this podcast, I want to identify how to change that. I'm aware it's a lofty goal, but if by the end of it, 
we can come up with a system that genuinely encourages and enables everyone to put their own voice out there. I think we're going to go some bit of the way to having a mechanism to solve some of the increasingly complex problems that we're facing. At the very least, more people are likely to feel that they can contribute towards solutions. And podcasting is just a vehicle for enabling that. I'm really interested to start looking at things like the psychology of desire, the archetypes, and the animus and the anima. All of the deeper and even the darker aspects of individuation and the human experience. But I also think in doing that, you've got to do more than just talk about it. Especially because I didn't study psychology. You have to be able to give people a vehicle to transcend some of it. And it really seems to me that many of the mental health challenges that some people face relate to a lack of deeper purpose or authentic direction in life. And I don't want to spend the whole time trying to diagnose a problem without at least trying to provide the solution. So part of the idea of discussing a podcast first is that it's a vehicle to discuss the positive elements of individuation. And when we get into some of the deeper stuff, we can come back to the positive in terms of how it relates to our deeper positive purpose and life goals. We'll also be guaranteed an activity that will provide deep satisfaction and to help navigate some of the more confronting or challenging aspects of individuation. To quote Napoleon Hill from Think and Grow Rich, positive and negative emotions cannot occupy the mind at the same time. And I think if people are going to be talking about things like mental health, you have to ensure that your audience has a positive outlet so they're not just left to stew with the negative emotions and relying on you to help absolve them. So that's part of the idea of linking it with starting a podcast. It's so that we can actively explore and apply the themes as we go along. It's about more than just talking about it. That's all we've got time for today. As I said, next week, we'll be looking at what it means to be a teacher versus a preacher. Because although it's central to being a good podcast host, there's also so many other areas of life where it helps to be able to transfer skills, not just pass on information and hope that people are able to integrate it themselves. Then, in two weeks, I've got a super special treat. But I won't give away too much about that now. You'll have to subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or your favourite podcast player and stay tuned so that you can keep up with the latest. Thanks so much for spending some time with me today. I hope to do it again on the next episode of Individuate.